great. We're back here at Copper Bore American Pub in North Liberty. Our player guest for the night, drum roll. I'm just trying to make Will Calverly forward for the Heartlanders. A, a little nervous, Will? I, I don't know if you're a little nervous or you're just excited to be here. It's good, been a good day, it seems like. Yeah, a little bit of both. A little, a little nervous, bit of both. but really excited to be here and answer some questions. Yeah, this is uh, this is the easiest community appearance you'll ever do all season. Perfect. And the reason why is that you're literally just answering questions about yourself. So you're gonna be you're gonna be just fine. I'm just yeah. I'm just messing around with you. So yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, let's jump right into it. And uh, hey, this has been a this has been a fun year for a lot of reasons. Um, the last month has been really fun yeah there's been a lot of wins um there's been a lot of b team building there's been a lot of guys getting to know each other there's been some continuity as well knock on wood which is always a thing in the uh in the ever-changing hockey league the echl so when you think about the strides this team has made over the last month what do you think about um i think just sticking with everything and uh guys just becoming closer like i mean i think we talked in Cincinnati that one time, and I said it's going to take some time. A lot of new faces here, and a lot of revol it's like a revolving door. A lot of new faces always, but I think um, we just got comfortable with each other, familiar with one another, and I think it shows over the past month. Uh, a lot of smiles on the ice, and everyone's just kind of in a good mood. I, you know, I, I, depending on where I sit, I, I get to look over sometimes, see you guys interacting on the bench, and um, I think back to the Sunday game against Toledo as the the walleye were going on that amazing run. Uh, to tie the game and there was never a time when and I don't look over all the time because I'm watching the game but you know sometimes during whistles and it seemed like the chatter and the focus kind of kind of kept up for the most part yeah yeah we made that one pretty interesting on Sunday but uh no yeah we were just we knew all along that we had it we just had to stick to what we were doing and obviously like you said Toledo's a really good team and they capitalized on the chances we gave them but we couldn't let that distract us from the fact that we were playing a pretty good hockey game yeah and the first the first half of the game was nearly nearly flawless Toledo even in the first period had a lot of chances outshot Iowa in the second period uh, the team took control at the start and then a lot of penalties started happening and I think that I'm curious your thoughts too is that I don't necessarily think Toledo got back in the game because the Heartlanders were playing so poorly that it just, like, the game started to get away. I think it was just some penalties here or there, and they, they capitalized on, on chances again. Do you think that that's a pretty fair, like, yeah. assessment? Yeah, I think five on five, it was a it was a good game throughout the entire game. But like you said, we, we gave them a lot of power plays, and we had a lot of power plays ourselves. But uh kind of kills the flow of the game a little bit at times, and they were able to capitalize on all our – when we took penalties, and they're good that way. Am I mistaken that I, I thought I saw you out on the power play in the bumper roll there a couple times? Yep. In the, yep. Yeah, that's where that's where they got me right now. So I'll just try to get open, support the guys, and do what I can. I'm going to do the best I can to explain what the bumper roll is on a power play because I, I, I'll use it on the air occasionally too. So basically it's like a 2-2-1 two, two, setup. I, or 2-1-2 uh, two, 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 one. Two, two, one, two setup. 1-2-2. One, one, two, one, two. Yeah, no, 1-3-1. One, one. Sorry, kinda. One, let's try that again. 1-3-1. One, one. So you got one guy in front of the net. You got three guys lined up, one in the left wing circle, one in the slot, right, kind of by in front of the net, and one on the right wing circle. And then you have the one guy, like the quarterback on the point. So that's like Landon Kozier normally like stands like the center of the blue line and will be able to pass the puck around. So I find the bumper roll super interesting because when you're standing in the middle of the slot there, teams are forced to make sure you don't get it because yeah. – Think about it in basketball. It's like a center standing right, almost right underneath the hoop. Like you get it to the wide open center, you can dunk it in or get a good scoring chance. So, what do you view as the role of playing the bumper there on the power play? Um, it's kind of like a distraction in a sense, just yeah. kind of take the eyes away from other guys and hopefully draw someone into me. Because obviously, when you're in the slot, they want to cover you, so they think you're the highest threat, and then you can open up ice for other guys and to hopefully find the play. And the big thing is just to make sure you're supporting the guy with the puck. So they always have an outlet because at the end of the day, we have five, they have four. So usually I'm the guy that's kind of left open, but then hopefully I drag someone with me to open up something else for other guys. And when you say open up something else, you're talking about the guys on the wings. Yeah, the guys, the shooters on the wings. Like I can really shoot the puck. So like, who's that? On our unit, it's Budgie. And uh, on the weekend, it was Spotch. Yep, and, J and Jesse Jocks has yeah, played in that Jocks. role as well um, throughout, the, throughout the course of the year. So just something interesting because not a lot of teams like – especially at this level in the NHL, it's like a, it's become a more permanent fixture. But 
I find that in this league, like not every team looks to do something like that. No, yeah, I mean, every team's kind of different in this league, I found. So uh, I think we found something that's been kind of working for us. And um, that first unit does a really good job moving the puck. And then when we get a chance, we just want to make sure uh, we have an opportunity to score or do something like that. So we just kind of try to model ourselves after that first unit. And the Heartlanders scored twice on the power play as well. Toledo scored three times on the power play. They arguably have two or three of the best power play players in the league, and they've done that to uh, a few teams this year. So Iowa was able to get a win on Sunday, and I talked about it this way too. It's a 10-game road trip. When every time over this road trip, the team is able to get a win before they're back home on December 15th to be home for a six-game homestand. It's not quite playing with house money, but you're taking away a game that a team on their home ice is wanting to defend. Yeah. So you beat Kalamazoo, beat Toledo. I'm forgetting the other one off the top of my head. I don't know why. Kalamazoo, Wheeling. Toledo, and Wheeling. That's right. Uh, obviously forgettable because it was in Wheeling. Just kidding. Um, but you, when every time you get a point or win these games, you are directly affecting the fact that another team's not going to have a chance to defend home ice as well. Yeah. So – how do you approach it from that standpoint that it's such a long road trip and being able to be about 500 through the road trip is hugely important for what's going to come down the stretch? Yeah, we just kind of always look at it in the sense of we break it up into whatever it is. So this weekend will be three games. So we'll go based off that first game. And then usually that last game, we try to see where we're at. So if we won the first one, lost the second one, we're one and one. So let's just try to get the win, have the weekend going our way. Uh, we always just try to win the weekend or whatever it is the road trip whatever as long as we can come out two and one three and two or three and one whatever it is uh we're happy and we think we've had a successful trip teams also played really well on home ice uh the six wins in a row which is the longest it's still an active streak as well which is the longest home winning streak in team history uh first two times in team history the heartlanders swept the same opponent in three straight games which is just a hard thing to do yeah. so when the Heartlanders swept Kalamazoo, that was the first time the Heartlanders beat the same opponent in the same week three times in a row, which Iowa uh, obviously ha plays two or three times against the same opponent a lot at home because of the uh, the geography and the longer home stands. So uh, when you think back on the home efforts, how hard is it to go and you beat a team once, now you got to do it again, and now you got to do it again. Like how difficult is that of a thing to pull off? It's tough. It's tough. The first night, uh, you're always excited, and then – you know, obviously teams make adjustments on the second night and you kind of watch video, you go over everything. But uh, no, I think it's just important to make sure that you stay true to your systems and stay true to yourselves as a team. And I think that's what we did in all six of those games. And we really, uh, I think, took it to the teams and proved that we're, we're a good hockey team. It seemed like, and I'm thinking back a few weeks, that um, against Kalamazoo, that the, the very similar styles, like, they're trying to essentially do to us what we're trying yeah. to do to them, which is why the games are, are so close. So when you think about like this team's structure, this team's identity, the culture, like what are some words that come to mind about the way the Heartlanders have been playing the last month? Um, I mean, a word we use a lot is going north, which is always trying to go downhill and uh, just force the teams to make mistakes. We want to be hard on the teams. And I think we show that with our physical play and, uh, yeah, we just want to be hungry and uh, hopefully make teams make mistakes and then that opens up the game for us and makes everything so much easier. And when you say physicality, it's interesting too because I wouldn't describe like physicality as always being, oh, there's a huge open ice hit and then there's a fight. Like that can get you out of position. It looks cool, yeah. but if you're not playing within the structure, if that doesn't happen within the structure of a game, you're, it looks awesome and it might maybe even give the team that does it a touch of a spark. But at the same time, it's, it might be harming what you're trying to do in the long run. So when you say how physical the team has been playing, what areas of the ice are you talking about where the Heartlanders are succeeding? Oh, yeah, 5'9". Not, I'm not throwing many big hits, but uh, <laughs> kind of in the sense. I just mean like getting in the lane, getting in guys' ways, making making them adjust the way they're moving or on their using our sticks in ways to just take pucks from them and, like I said, just bumping them because at the end of the day, um, those big hits don't always happen. When they do, they're great, but for the most part, it's always just about making the guy change where he's going with the puck and hopefully pressuring him into another teammate and making it a two-on-one. 
team Heartlanders again are at home December 15th, December 16th, December 17th against Toledo, and then the 21st, the 22nd, and the 23rd against Fort Wayne. Some big promotional nights. Forgot to talk about this with Derek, but Teddy Bear Toss coming up on December 16th. December 17th is uh, the elementary school game, like day, day game, which helps benefit as well the Iowa City uh, area school district and some other school districts as well with the purchase of a ticket, which is a great sign, a great thing. That's a Sunday game at 205 with a post-game skate. Then the Heartlanders play Fort Wayne again, as we mentioned, right before the holiday. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of holiday things and uh, uh, things going on at Extreme Arena on those days. So uh, teddy bear tosses, they're kind of, I think they happen in college. Uh, no, they no, never they did don't. actually. No, I did it in junior when I was 18, but uh, didn't do it in college. So this will be your first teddy bear toss in like six years, five years? No, uh, yeah, seven years. Yeah. Seven years, first teddy bear toss. Yeah, there's, they're awesome. I mean, it's so fun seeing the way the arena explodes and all the teddy bears coming on the ice after that first goal. Um, and then obviously it's for a great cause as well, so that always helps. Yeah, donated the teddy bears and uh, the stuffed animals thrown on the ice uh, are, are uh, donated to those that need this holiday season. And before I forget, I wanted to also mention that if you're here watching the show and you missed it earlier, uh, two things. You can come up, fill out a free uh, – slip of paper, uh, name, phone, and email uh, to win tickets to a future Heartlanders game. And Copper Boar is going to be collecting those and uh, calling for uh, the, the one that wins free ticket to a future game. And the second thing, which is next Monday happening here, Monday, December the 11th, we don't have a show here, but there's a big event going on at Copper Boar, which is that if you come by here to Copper Boar American Pub in North Liberty and you make a donation to the North Liberty Food Pantry, uh, you get a free meal of uh, tenderloin and fries for free. So uh, come by on Monday, December the 11th, all day here. You can make a donation and then... Um, I've always been one to enjoy tenderloin, best in the state, best in the country here, the tenderloin here in Iowa. Proud to say that. And uh, the fries are pretty good here too. So excited about that. But Will, wanted to transition a little bit, which is you have a you have a pretty, uh, I would say, interesting background, but it's also a background that a lot of people have, which yeah. is you grew up just outside of Toronto, Scarborough, Ontario, where you grew up your entire life. Yep, been there since I was born and uh, go back every summer. So it's a great place. Just outside, uh, f 10 mi 5, 10 miles from... Uh, I'm a kilometers guy, so I'd probably say <laughs> 15. 15 fif kilometers? Yeah, 15 so kilometers, 20 kilometers. So 8 outside. miles, 9 yeah. miles. All right, 10, 10 miles, 12 miles. Uh, that's fair. Um, and I said interesting path because um, uh, the path you've taken is, is, is one that every path is unique. But there's so much hockey where you grew up yeah. from, and it's just like... I can't even comprehend it. Where I grew up, there's not a ton of youth hockey. It's grown, but it's like more kind of on the side. But where you're from, you wake up, and I have to anticipate you were given a stick pretty early on. Uh, yeah, I started skating when I was four, and I hated every second of it. My mom told me I'd go, and I just wouldn't skate. I'd sit on the side, sit on the bench, and then the last day they brought out hockey sticks, and I ended up crawling out on the ice, grabbed a stick, and that's when I started playing hockey, so I was probably four years old. So you, you said you hated it? Hated it. My Why? mom my mom wasn't going to – they weren't going to put me in hockey. I'm the youngest of three, and uh, so everyone else played. So they, it was just kind of my path. And like you said, being from Toronto, everyone kind of plays. But hated skating, so my mom said, yeah, he's not going to play. And then that last day when they brought out the stick, she said, oh, never mind. So what I you – know, essentially, this Friday, we're going to be on the air in Kalamazoo and – going to say Will Calverly gets the puck. He grew up hating skating. That's, that's a fair As, thing to say. Yeah, that's my, not. If you say that, my mom will know exactly what you mean. <laughs> so you ended up sticking with it. Yep. And you've done pretty well for yourself. You're playing two levels below the NHL. Uh, but you're growing up in the Toronto area. And because it's so competitive and there there's a lot of sheets of ice to play on, yeah. but I'm sure you were playing at some really weird hours growing up. Like Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd be – up at six, going to the rink, playing at six thirty, um, and then usually playing another game that day as well at a different hour. Um, yeah, it was it was crazy. You know, um, there's just so many rinks there that you're always there's you always find somewhere to skate. You always find somewhere to play, and for the most part, I was pretty much going four or five times a week. And I remember too, like uh, uh, the team in Brampton, Ontario, when we would load into the rink there, that there would be competitive men's league games there. Yep sometimes going on at one two in the morning oh yeah oh yeah the men's like um i know my brother plays sometimes and i know he's uh he's sometimes eleven thirty. yeah 
getting home at 12. He's got work the next day. I don't know how he does it, but <laughs> you know, no, they we we love hockey in Toronto. It's crazy. The, these are the memes because, like, obviously the Heartlanders account. Uh, naturally shifts itself because we follow so many hockey teams. So, like, the Instagram algo for the Heartlanders account, it's the inside information, what we're look- what I'm looking at in the hotel bed as we're scrolling through and seeing who liked what. And, and I say, oh, we'll like the post. Like, oh, good, I'm doing something right. Uh, but it's like, it's always something to the effect of when your buddy in the men's league tells you that the game got pushed back and now you're starting at midnight and yeah. you have to be at work at 8 a.m. Yeah, yeah, no, so. it's... <laughs> I try to avoid it because I want to sleep, but uh, sometimes I'm at games that are 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and I mean, everyone's there with a smile on their face, so it, they just love it. These are also like super competitive games with guys yeah. that are like like yourself, like you're not playing against like someone who has never played hockey before. No, yeah, yeah, they're very competitive. They they get going, and then, like I said, I, sometimes I do skates at like 9 o'clock in the morning. Guys are coming from work, taking an early lunch. And instead of eating, they're playing hockey for playing an hour. Playing hockey for an hour. Going right back to their shift. That's uh, incredible, and I'm sure in some senses it, it resonates people here. Football, wrestling, yeah. uh, basketball, like all the all the sports here that um, are are huge uh, and resonate on the on the youth scene. But um, so you you started playing hockey when you were four. You hated it initially, grew to love it. What teams were you playing on? Like what what, what were the organized teams that you were playing on really early on really as early you started on. getting going? Uh, early on, it would have been uh, – they were called the Toronto Red Wings. Okay. Yeah, it was – and a, a lot of teams in Toronto take names after NHL teams. So there was the Toronto Red Wings, and I also played for the North York Rangers. Yep. Um, but, yeah, growing up, it was just – there was about 12 teams that you could pick from, and they were all across Toronto, Mississauga, uh, Brampton. But, uh, no, I was mostly with the Toronto Red Wings. What uh, what other sports, if any, were you playing when you were growing up? I played soccer all summer. So And then for school, I would run cross country every year. Really? Yeah, yeah, until hockey got in the way. And then I had to pick between hockey and soccer. And I think I made the right choice with you, that one. So you, you neglected the cross country. Yeah, so you didn't yeah really... the cross country was done once I realized it was, <laughs> it was more just a workout. It wasn't really that fun. Yeah, I've, I've heard that from hockey guys, too, which is like, when they play, I'm no talking offense. about no, when, yeah, that's right. When they uh, when hockey players play professionally, they hate running. Yep. Like, is it because you're just going faster on skates, or like what? Well, no, on skates you can glide and just kind of not move. Where running, you always <laughs> gotta be always gotta be working, and there's not really taking a break. So I think that's why. And and like I said, in hockey, if you don't really want to skate, you could just let the momentum take you. Okay, that's uh, but then when. Like when Derek retired, yeah, he's really into running now. He has gone run- for those that don't know Derek Damon. He has gone running. We'll get on the bus at seven a.m. He'll be running outside around the Iowa River, landing at like four thirty five in the morning before getting on the bus. Which I'm a psycho too, so I'll I'll run as well, like for like fifteen minutes. Like he'll go for a thirty minute run before getting on the bus for five or six. So he loves running now. So in about. Uh, after you have a very long storied career, we'll check back in with you in 20 years yeah. and you'll be, uh, you'll be running every day of your life is my anticipation. I doubt it, but you never know. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned playing soccer as well. Were you any, were you any good or no, not really. No, no, I played for fun. Just played for fun. Yeah. It gave me something else to do other than hockey. Yeah. Cause I mean, I needed a break at times, but, uh, no, I, it was fun. I, it was the easiest sport to pick up, too, and it wasn't too time-consuming, which was nice. Yeah, it, it's it's not, and obviously a lot of kids grow up playing soccer. I did as well, and I got probably kicked out when I started realizing it was fun to intentionally trip people. Uh, gutless gutless move on my <laughs> part. Uh, you mentioned the North York Rangers. Uh, Nick Campoli played for the North yep. York Rangers. I know you guys kind of were around the same time, but different, like Dif- a couple different, games? Different teams. Yeah. Different teams. So he played on the uh, Junior A team, and I was playing on the Midget team. So uh, I'd get called up, or I'd go practice with his team every once in a while. So we kind of know each other, but uh, yeah, we, we were on different teams technically. But w- within the same within that's the ju- same organization, which speaks to like how many because you're not talking like age level, you're talking no. about actual like team A of the 18 year olds is here and team B of the 16 like team A, or you talking it, no, it'd be kind of I guess like uh, AHL ECHL kind of thing. So yeah. he was on like the I guess equivalent of being like the AHL team where I was the, on the team below. <laughs> okay, and then sometimes I would get called up to practice or play with them. Okay, which makes sense because when I clicked on some of this, like you were on the New- the North York Rangers 
U18, yeah. AAA, and you were the captain of that team. Yeah. And then I remember clicking on the regular North York Rangers in the uh, the OJHL, which is the Ontario Junior Hockey League, which is different than the Ontario Hockey League, yep. which would prevent you from playing college hockey. Uh, but anyway, so you played three games with Nick yes. on the OJHL team yeah. while also being the captain of the U18 AAA team. Exactly, so yeah. if we haven't confused you enough, we're doing the best we can. A lot of can. leagues, a lot of teams. That's Yeah, a lot of leagues, a lot of teams. Um this is something I, I don't think I've ever really asked a Toronto guy on this show, which is we talk about how much there is, how many levels, how like competitive is it to be on these top level teams amongst the parents, amongst the players? Like what's that like growing up in that kind of atmosphere? It's it's crazy. I've, every game, so usually every team, like whatever league you're in, every team's playing that day, usually yeah. in the same rink. So you're seeing parents from other teams talking to other parents and they're getting competitive because their <laughs> their kids doing great their kids not doing so well their son's team's doing good but uh no it's just the buzz that follows everything hockey wise in toronto is just it is crazy the um I, I think it's interesting too because there's the competitiveness of it and there's also like how you're able to compart uh, to, to act like to act like an adult at that age because there's colleges that might start looking at you. There's uh, high-level junior leagues like Chilliwack and the British Columbia Hockey League, who you played for. So how did you handle yourself amidst all this pressure and everybody's talking in your ear about, oh, this and this and that? You're hearing all these things, and everybody's trying to figure out their path. Yeah, every, like you said, everyone's trying to figure it out. I was grateful to have coaches that took uh, a liking to me and like, actually helped me out. So the whole reason I went to Chilliwack was because my coach was good <clears throat> friends with the coach in Chilliwack, so he was able to connect us there. And then, uh, you know, I just talked with my parents, and my parents would help me out with all those decisions. So um, they made it easy on me, and I just had to worry about playing hockey, and they kind of did all the background checks on everything for me. Chilliwack is about two hours east of uh, east of Vancouver. Yep. The BCHL is the British Columbia Hockey League. It's a junior league. You still keep your college eligibility when you go there. A lot of Heartlanders players um, it, it have, have developed in the BCHL. Uh, I'm also a little jealous because you got to live arguably in one of the nicest areas of North America um, in the British Columbia Hockey League. So what were some of your favorite places to uh, to play, visit when you were in the BCHL for two years? Chilliwack was really nice, actually, yep. but uh, Penticton, yep. but it was unbelievable. And then uh, we had a good rivalry going with Wenatchee in uh, Washington. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, uh, and they're now in the Western the, the Hockey Western League. Hockey they got the bump up. Yeah. So they had, we had a good rivalry there. So going there was always cool The the fans were crazy, but, uh, just being in Chilliwack, like you said, it was so beautiful. The mountains everywhere you wake up every morning, it's just surrounded. So it was really nice to be there. A lot different than Toronto. And you won an RBC cup there, which the RBC cup is a mixture of all these junior A leagues. So there's the BCHL, there's the AJHL, which is Alberta, the SGHL, SJHL, Saskatchewan Junior Hockey League. All these leagues are competing to win the RBC Cup. And I've heard from guys that it's, I mean, it's a huge deal yep. to be able to be on a team that you're the best junior A team in Canada. Yeah, yeah we got, we were hosting it that year. So we were able, we got an automatic exemption into the tournament, which... I mean, take I'll, it. Well, yeah, we'll take it. I still won it. But uh, so, yeah, we were able to be in that. And then we played uh, two teams from Ontario, a uh, team from we played Wenatchee from the BCHL. And then we played a team from Manitoba and a team from Saskatchewan. And we were able to win that tournament, which was really cool. It was, it's probably it's one of the coolest things that I've won. And from there, you had your college commitment to RIT, which is the Rochester Institute of Technology yeah. in Rochester, New York. Uh, when did you commit there? How did that all work out? Uh, kind of same thing as what got me to Chilliwack. My, the same coach went to RIT as well, and he got me in contact with those coaches there. And so I committed when I was 17 out of the GTH, or North York Rangers, before I went over to Chilliwack. Give me the best and worst thing about living in Rochester, New York. Best thing? Ooh. I know the worst is the weather. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was gonna say. I mean, <laughs> con actually, yeah. Okay, yeah. We'll go weather worst, and then the best thing, uh, the garbage plates there were pretty good. It's I a was, staple. To explain, I was hoping you'd say that. Uh, what What is a garbage plate for someone that's never heard of it? And this, remember, we're in a restaurant, so you yeah. can like like people want to talk about food and think about Fair food. Enough. It's ex yeah. kind of exactly what it sounds like. It's whatever the restaurant has. Usually, it's potatoes, fries. fries, meat, coleslaw. They just throw it on a plate. 
and you just dig into it. It's all kind of just, I guess it's a Rochester state. I'd never heard of it before, but yeah. I mean, it's famous in Rochester and it was probably one of my favorite things. Yeah. So that's like the kind of thing that you eat at, in the season, like probably try to avoid it unless there's no other options, but in the off season. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You don't really <laughs> eat it in the season, but then once the season's <laughs> over, I, I got a couple garbage plates for sure. They, they are really interesting. I've only had it one time ever. Um, totally worth trying, yeah. but it's like everything that – imagine if we took everything everyone ordered here. And threw today, it on a plate. And there was some kind of sauce that brought it all together is sort of the – Yeah, usually ketchup or – isn't it like yeah, yeah, something like that? It, like ranch, ketchup. It doesn't uh, sound good. I, I understand <laughs> that, but – If it's done well, it's done yeah. well, though. Um, we're running – we only have 10 minutes left, so I wanted to ask. So you captained Rochester, captained RIT, uh, and then you had a decision to make. Yeah. So – you ended up playing for Merrimack, which is in uh, North Andover, Massachusetts, for your fifth year, which was just last year. You were you were playing college hockey just last year before turning pro. So how did that all happen? How, how were you able to, to make that decision to go and finish your college career at Merrimack? Yeah, I, I, once I graduated from RIT, it was either I would turn pro or do another year, and I just thought um, hockey's not going to be here forever. So if I could get my master's and, as well as play hockey, that was probably the best decision for me personally. And then um, – just when the coach from Merrimack reached out, he was so friendly and he took an actual interest in me as a person rather than just a hockey player, which I thought was really cool. And then, so that was probably the main reason why I decided to go to Merrimack. And we've seen a couple former Heartlanders players uh, do their fifth year at Merrimack. Jake Durflinger was the year before Will Calverly. Uh, Joe Exter, associate coach, he played at Merrimack for four years, one of the best goalies in Merrimack history there. He signed with Florida. Yep. They're pretty good. And you won a Kelly Cup there last year. You yeah. were Kelly Cup. You were holding the Kelly Cup on the ice last year, and you played in all in the final. Did you play in the final game? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. You played yeah, in the I final game in the final too. Game, yeah, you had the game-winning goal, I think, in game three as well. Yep. So that was. I mean, you're you're coming off winning a Kelly Cup, man. So how the how the heck did that happen? What was that like to be yeah, able no, to that do was, that? That was special. Uh, so yeah, once I finished with school with Merrimack, I uh, Florida called and I decided to go there. And then uh, we kind of just went on this playoff run. We finished fourth last year, or fourth in the South, and then just went on a pretty magical playoff run. And it was definitely something I'll never forget, being the, able to lift that Kelly Cup. And that and that's something, too. Like, you win a championship like that, and in order to be able to do that, it is this is a uh, like a cliche, but there is a moment where everybody that was playing in those games had to step up. Yeah. Or make it make an impact, or make a moment, and I and I think back to when I worked in the USHL and the team I was working for had the chance to win the Clark Cup there, and that like you think back and you remember uh, individual moments of guys that you know they could have been third or fourth liners, but they had a moment where they stepped up. They either had a big defensive player, or, you know, the goalie made a big save. Or, so when you think back on that experience, how does that relate to what we're what I was just talking about there? Yeah, I mean, I think throughout that everybody stepped up. Uh... There was guys that had maybe three goals throughout the entire regular season, finished with three in playoffs. Uh, guys were doing every blocking shots. Our goalies, the goalie was stepping up. But there was just, it's usually like it is with all playoffs. It's always the guys that you least expect it to kind of step up and win it. And that's exactly what happened with Florida last year. The way you play, I really, and Derek, obviously, we were talking about this right before you came in. You go, you go to the net. Like you get to the, I call it the greasy areas, the dirty areas. There's a thousand ways you can say it, but what is it about that kind of way that you play that makes you difficult to play against? Um, I think it's just an area that not a lot of guys enjoy going to. So, in in order to defend it, it's tough too because um, they also don't want to defend in that area. But as kind of like you saw in Kalamazoo, uh, sometimes pucks just hit you and go in. So. I'm trying to take them as any can, any way I can, so that's usually why I go to that area. Like, and Derek talks about it all the time too. That like we got to get to the front of now. We got to win the dirty areas, but it's harder. It's it's easier said than done. Yeah, it's it sometimes sucks when you go to the net and you just get cross checked four or five <laughs> times in the back or in the arms. But uh, it's all worth it when you're winning games or anything like that. So that's usually uh, the mindset I have. And that's one of the things that I mean, you've scored six goals, and unless I'm missing something, all six have been like. There's, right there. There's a chance I don't score from above the hash marks this year. <laughs> Hit the post, r rushing it at the circle the other game, too. I was like, oh, here, oh the post, of course. Um, let's go into the finer's five. We've got a few minutes left. Here we go. I want to be able yeah. You're going to be fine. The, these are things that you know. Hopefully. These are, like, these are 
hopefully things that you know. Uh, you got to rank one through three here, one being the best. Okay. So we'll start at three. So three, two, one. Uh, pancakes, waffles, and French toast. French toast, three. Waffles, two. Pancakes, one. No, and, no, sorry. Pancakes, two. Waffles, one. You got waffles yeah, at one? Waffles, one. I thought you were going to say waffles, three. No. Well, I'm, a, I'm a waffle guy. Why? I don't know. Well, they're usually at hotels. It's easy. Yeah, we got the waffle the, Yeah, maker. when you're on the road, it's something easy. So you're saying when we were in Wheeling a few weeks ago, you were you – were Privy to the waffle yeah. machine. Oh, I'm going right to the waffle machine. Like, but like, do you? Go, I feel like there's a decor with the waffle machine. Like, you can't be too aggressive. You, you're saying you're aggressive. I know what I want. I'm going to get a waffle. Yeah. You're not even pretending you want no. the fake scrambled eggs. No, I'm or, not touch. I don't touch the eggs in hotels. I just go strictly for the waffles. What do you put on it? Just syrup. syrup. Yeah, just syrup. Just syrup. syrup. All right. Okay. They got whipped cream, it. maybe. Really? No, maybe not on game day, but no, 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 no. But otherwise, I'm yeah. not gonna. Uh, no, we'll. Yeah, yeah. Cut that. Uh. Big win. You're on the bus. Team stops at a gas station. What's your What's your go-to like snack? Like, what are you bringing back on the bus? Um, bueno chocolate bars. What's that? Bueno, the chocolate bars. Oh, bueno, bueno chocolate yeah. bars. Okay. And I'm getting a bag of chips. I'm just trying to smart food. Oh, smart yeah. food like the popcorn. The popcorn. Yeah. Uh, if you were in Canada, yep. would you get co- a coffee crisp after yes. the game? Yes, so I, very we, much. We brought up the two Canadian snacks. They have Coffee Crisp is an amazing, amazing. That's my it's favorite the, chocolate yeah, it's bar. The best chocolate. The best chocolate bar. Uh, worth ordering online. Uh, here's something that you should know too. In Kalamazoo, we're going there this week. Yeah. There's an international candy shop on um, downtown. Okay. Um, I'll try to find the name of it because I've been there because it's the only place in the ECHL that's not a, a Canadian team to get. Coffee crisp, okay, from my perf- knowledge. Oh, perfect. So uh, I'm going to try to figure out the name for you. And uh, hopefully after a couple big wins in Kalamazoo, you can enjoy some coffee crisp oh, on the bus. I might actually try to figure out a way. I completely forgot until we were just talking thank about God it. you mentioned it. Uh, so i got to write that down. Candy. Okay. Candy Kazoo. Uh, who's the best on the speaker right now in the room? What kind of music they play? And who's who's running the aux right now in the room? And who's who's the best at it? Um, Kev's running it right now. Um Jonesy's pretty good with it too, but uh, Kev's Kev's got all the music and he kind of plays everything. He takes requests, which I like. So whatever you're feeling, he's playing. He, I, I made a comment that I liked the song that was playing, and he said, "Oh, you like that? You like that?" And I said, "Yeah." I didn't realize it was him running the aux. Yeah. Though. Oh yeah. He'll take full credit for it too. So, and he did take full. Yeah, he, he did. No, he runs a good. He runs a yeah. good aux. You need a good captain to have exactly the, that. That just adds validity to yeah. it when the captain's on the on the aux. I had it Sunday morning, and it was probably the most stressful thing. Of the entire day. It's a stressful thing oh, to run very, it. Oh, very, very. you, you got to find the good mix so guys are ha- – everyone's happy. Um, what were you playing? Country? Yeah, I just went with country. And yeah, you're I, big I think country I did fan. a good job, but – We won. Yeah, well, yeah, but I probably won't have it again. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you weren't playing hockey, what would you be doing with your life right now? Ooh. I don't know. That's the second toughest one. The toughest one is the last one I'm oh, going to ask. Great. Didn't, perfect. I didn't forget. Perfect. <laughs> Um, maybe a chef. I love to cook. Really? Yeah. I always debated culinary school in the summer, or just like culinary classes. So like you, what do you, so you're saying you're cooking at the apartment kind of yeah, thing. Oh yeah. What do you make? Oh yeah. I, anything. Usually what I see on Instagram or TikTok, any like Go to the recipes. recipes there. Yeah. I try to follow up with those. I, I like that. What's yeah. the, what's the last thing you made that like a new last new thing you made? Ooh, last new. We've thing. been on the road so long. It's yeah. kind of an unfair yeah, question. Yeah. Um, it was some chicken thigh recipe I saw. It was like a sweet and sour chicken <laughs> with rice. It was good. Yeah, it was pretty good. I thought it. I thought it was good. <laughs> we come to uh, my favorite question. You're the first one, first player to be asked this this year. But like last year, I asked it every single year. Okay, so th- I'm gonna make a what? Oh yeah, everyone God. knows here. Okay, so um, <laughs> this is an imaginary scenario. Okay, you're trapped uh, with a grizzly bear. Okay, like in a cage, big cage. Yep. Uh, Let's just say you're just trapped with a grizzly bear. You know you're going to have to fight it. You don't have any weapons. Okay. No weapons. How many of you do you need to be able to take down this grizzly bear? How many Will Calverleys will it take to take down this grizzly bear? No weapons. Okay. One for each leg. Get on the back. Like, so this thing yeah. is, like, surrounded, like, Surround, obviously one yeah. of you. You probably got to sacrifice at least one of you. Yeah, so, but all right, then, we'll, we'll go seven or eight. That's pretty confident, man. Yeah, I, you got to think so. 
Did I got I got some faith. I think Reese said three last year, which yeah. was just per pot, no, no chance. No. So I feel like the average answer is like between ten to like fifteen. Well, that's guaranteeing it. Yeah. I like to be a little risky. Don't wait. Okay, like you want. Yeah, I mean, well, I, if I <laughs> I could say twenty, and I'm definitely winning. Well, but that's the thing too. It's like, how confident are you? So you're confident yeah. that seven eight, or eight of you. Seven or eight. All right. So, so, okay, that's fair. I like that. You survived the finer's five. Good Perfect. job, Will. Well, it's been a great episode here as always. Um, I, we always appreciate when the guys uh, the guys so. play along. Thanks again, everyone. Been a great show. Great night, and have a great rest of your night.